introduce me to your two guys. They, they look like your bodyguards. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've got Pete and Colin here with us. Uh, Pete is a neighbor of mine. Uh, we met a little over a year ago as we were out in my neighborhood just caring for neighbors. And uh, after caring for Pete through prayer, uh, after a few interactions with him, he came to Christ and received baptism. And then over the subsequent weeks, I continued to get phone calls about him asking questions on how to baptize his mom and his brother um, and, and, and here recently his dad as well. And, and so the Lord has really worked mightily in Pete's life and he's become a leader uh, here in the city. Um, and this is Colin. Colin and his wife, Lindsay, have really uh, set the tone in Austin for what does it look like to work a full-time job and pursue movement as well. Um, and, and just figuring out that balance of, I want to make and multiply disciples. I want to uh, see the kingdom of God advance. And, and yet I have this full-time job that I need to balance. And so um, they've seen tremendous fruit in their neighborhood as well. Um, and so just wanted that, both of them to be here to be able to share collective lessons together on what God's doing here in Austin. That's great. And um, we'll treat them with respect because I think Pete especially looks a little bit dangerous to me. So I'm glad he's following Jesus. I hope he's, you know, got any, any anger issues out of the way. Um, so he's, he's smiling. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, Garrett, how, how did you get into this movement stuff? What's, what's been your story? Mm -hmm. Uh, a few years ago, I, was, uh, I studied business at the University of Georgia and honestly had every intention on working in business for the rest of my life. Um, and then I, I went to the Middle East for, on a summer trip, and God really used that to open my eyes to uh, unreached people groups and just seeing that from Genesis to Revelation, he has a plan and he's moving all of history towards the fulfillment of that plan. Um, and so I came home from that trip sensing God tell me to put the business dream behind um, and to follow him. And uh, at the time, I didn't know what that meant, but I worked for about six more months, and then the Lord opened up a door uh, for me to work on a role with a mission agency where we were setting up CPM trainings in the Middle East and Asia for about two years. Um, and then after those two years, the Lord led me to Austin. And uh, month one in Austin, a, a buddy of mine and I were out uh, sharing with people and frustrated. And we prayed and asked God to connect us with somebody who could help us figure out how to do movement, pursue movement locally. And uh, the very next day, we, there was a gathering of people in Austin. And there's about 100 people in the room that were wanting to be full-time uh, missionaries overseas. And uh, Ying Kai was the one who came and spoke. And about uh, halfway through, there was a woman in the crowd who said, Ying, that's, that's great for what's happening in China. Um, but what about here in America? How, what does this look like in the U.S.? And uh, Ying pointed to Fred and Melissa Campbell in the back of the room and said, that's my friend Fred Campbell. Uh, he'll tell you anything you need to know about movement. And so after that, I made a beeline for Fred. And uh, for really the last three years now, Fred and Melissa have been uh, coaching me and coaching our, our team here in Austin. Right. We've, we've had Fred and Melissa over here a year ago to help a, a lead a push in, uh, in Leicester. And uh, I, just last week, I met Ying Kai for the first time. He's Ying and Grace. They're, they're an amazing couple. They're such a blessing. So, um, so you got hooked in with someone who was already going down this track. What, what unfolded next? Uh, I think specifically there was a couple of things. There, legitimately, there was just a, a resolve to say, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I don't even know what I'm doing, but we just need to go do it. We just need to go do the work. Um, and get out and so I just chose to start my own neighborhood and that's how Pete and I met um, we just started working in and around the area where I live and just saying we, we need to figure out how do we care for people um, and ultimately how do we see leaders developed in such a way that a movement would would break out across the city and so we just started one step at a time um, really failing forward going to neighbors offering prayer um, and then following up and sharing our stories wrapped around the gospel um, and just beginning to share with people. And what we noticed was when we were inside people's homes and they would make the decision to follow Christ, that usually would lead to their families choosing to follow Christ as well. Um, and, and ultimately... Why don't we just bring Pete in at this stage? So what happened for you, Pete, when, when you met Garrett? 
<laughs> well, I was already at a point in my life where, um, where I uh, was tired of living the way I was living. And uh, I had already asked, um, I, was, I come from a, a Catholic background. I had already asked God to help me out. And I guess he'd help me out, but I'd uh, always fall off, you know? And uh, I was just tired of living like that already. And uh, when uh, these guys came along, um, uh, they um, spoke to me and uh, I really felt, you know, something um, working within me. So I asked God one more time and, uh, and then that time, he actually, um, I asked him with faith and uh, he actually, um, I guess, listened to me. So he took that wand of the, the vices of drugs and alcohol and everything. The next day I was free from that. And I was like, four days into it, I was like, what's happening? You know, I've never gone this long without this stuff. And so I just started praying to God more and more. And then to this day, I don't have any wand for any of that stuff. And how, how did you meet Garrett? Uh, out in the street, did he knock on your door? What happened? Uh, he, was going, he was going to my house trying to meet my brother, which he'd already met before. And so he was, and I was out, and that day I happened to be there. And um, when he came to my house, um, I thought he was like a Mormon because there was a bunch of Mormons walking around. Yeah. Or maybe I was witness. So that day I was I was kind of drunk, so I was, you know, I was I was about ready to get to pick him up and throw him off my property. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <You> could pay. <laughs> His friend Ronnie just started uh, speaking with me, and uh, he kind of he made me cry with just talking to me. <laughs> I was like, you know, I just broke down in tears from what he told me, and that was because um, I just felt so bad about what was going on in my life, and and, and I wasn't planning to, to come to Christ or anything. I wasn't planning to do any of that. Matter of fact, I was planning to go out of the street and buy some more drugs and more alcohol. But then I met them, and um, I met them, and I just didn't want that anymore. I mean, after that, but they kind of got that movement in my, in my life started, so I wouldn't, so I'll start following Christ. So even when you sobered up, you, you, I mean, it's one thing to talk to someone who's drunk, but you, you sobered up and said, yep, this is what I want to do. Yes. Yes. Um, like I said, uh, I was, uh, I prayed, I prayed to God that, that he take that, that, had that, uh, that want of drugs and alcohol out of me. And he did. And like I said, the, for the fourth day, I was like, what's going on? You know, I haven't had gone this long. And the fifth day went by and it, I still didn't have any urge to want it. Then a week went by and I kept on praying and that urge never came back for me to want um, to, to use again. Wow. Yeah. And <clears throat> the gospel spread to your family? Um, yes. Uh, we started, uh, I started reading and my mom was, she's like, I, said, I come from a Catholic background, so she was already, um, she was already into the, into the, into the Bible. But then I started, we started actually reading it because we didn't read it. We just went over the passages they gave us on Sunday at church. We never actually read the Bible. Hmm. So we started reading it and, um, you know, we started finding all this stuff out about being baptized and how you're supposed to repent to be baptized and how um, it's not, it doesn't count. I mean, I myself, I know that it didn't count if I was a little baby and got baptized. That didn't account for anything that it was supposed to account for. So I, I, that's when I called Gary, like, probably a week later. I said, yeah, I um, need to get baptized. Because I, I read it myself in the Bible, and um, <clears throat> my mother, uh, I think like a month later, she did the same thing. Mm. And then my father came later on, and my, my my brother actually, one of my brothers. I mean, we we've had um, like the Bible says that we uh, when you clean the house out, seven more demons escape. You get weak, seven more that happened to my brother. So even the, I mean, even that shows me the Bible has a lot of truth in it. It's mm. all truth. So. You know, I had, my brother was baptized, and then he just he he didn't he didn't anchor down in the word, and seven more demons came into his heart, more powerful. So we're trying to help him right now. So yeah, okay. And one of the things that I really enjoy over and over again when Pete and I are training together is someone will ask him a question, and he'll say, "Oh, Garrett didn't convince me. The word of God convinced me." Hmm. And just seeing over time, he's become more and more addicted to the word of God. Uh, and that's what's flowing out of him as he share as he talks to other people. It's just the word just coming out of him. And so I think it's been fun to, you know, as we've implemented the three thirds process uh, in the discipleship uh, with Pete and his family, how Pete has taken that and turned around and done it with his family. And that really has, uh, the word has become front and center for them. So is that happening in their home, Garrett? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's happening at, and who, who leads those studies? Do you lead them or one of, does Pete lead them? 
Pete Leeson. Okay. Yes, sir. I was um <coughs> recently made leader, leader of uh, my of my group. We have like a group of five or maybe sometimes six people every Friday night. You're welcome to come every Friday <laughs> night. <at 8 o'clock. laughs> I'm from Texas, St. John, so we're going to wait for you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I would like that. I'll bring my wife, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, both of y'all. Okay, so that sort of encounter you've had with Pete and, and his, his family, that's happening across, uh, well, your focus is on Austin. Mm-hmm. So is that right across the city? Uh, how, how are you pursuing the call? Yeah, so one, uh, one thing that we've done all along the way is Paul states, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we've just continued to look at Jesus and what did Jesus actually do? What did he do? Why did he do it? And what we've noticed just again and again, there's a pattern from Luke 3 to Luke 10 where Jesus is modeling for us how to make leaders, how to multiply leaders. And he starts by modeling it. He models a pattern of proclaim, heal, and find people of peace from Luke 3 to, to Luke 8. It's all just modeling a, a pattern. Proclaim, heal, find people of peace. Proclaim, heal, find people of peace. And then 8 to 10, it's like he's pre- prep, uh, or 8 and 9, he's prepping the 12, and then he sends them. They come back, the ten, uh, Luke 10, he sends 72 others, all with the same instructions. He sends them out to proclaim, heal, and find people of peace. And so whenever we get stuck, we, we just look to Jesus and say, what it what, how does Jesus handle this? Um, and specifically, early on, what we noticed was Jesus had Galilee. He, he focused on Galilee. Galilee is 200,000 people. And so we just circled an area on the map of 200,000 and started there and just said, let's do the things Jesus did to multiply leaders. And so early on, the focus was how do, how do I model, how do we model a, a pattern for other leaders to imitate? Uh, and so that they could reproduce it out across the city. Um, and so that was a little over a year ago. And, and since then, Austin is 2 million people, 70% of which won't enter the church. That's 1.4 million people. And uh, the Lord has raised up leaders uh, in such a way where we are, we've split the city into seven Galilees now, seven regions at 200,000 people. And that, that constitutes the 1.4 million that, that we're going after. Um, and so by God's grace, there's, there are leaders rising up both from the harvest and from the pre-existing church um, that are saying, we want to own this pocket of lostness. Um, and so then from there, we go in and we just model that pattern of uh, leadership development. And then we empower the leaders and let them uh, take it from there and we coach them. So typically, what, what is that? So you're doing two things at the same time. One is you're, you're in the harvest. And two, you've got someone with you. That's right. Um, what does that look like? Just practically, what, what do you do when you go out? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we found it helpful to have a, a time to invite people to go out with us. And so Saturday mornings from 10 to 12 and Sundays from 3 to 5, we'll, we'll, there'll be groups of people gather all over the city. And there's the team that's leading those areas will will cast some vision and just stating, hey, here's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, we'll have everybody pray. We'll split people into teams of two and three. And then we'll, we'll go out for a little over an hour uh, into pre-chosen neighborhoods, uh, apartment complexes, uh, this, both in the suburbs and in, in the urban center. Um, and Specifically, the first time we go out, all we're trying to do is care through people, or care for people through offering prayer. And so we'll we'll meet somebody, introduce ourselves, and we'll just say real we'll, real briefly, "Hi, my name is Garrett. This is my friend Pete. We're out caring for the community today, and we are wondering, is there anything that you or your family need that we could pray and ask God to help you with?" And then they'll share. Say, "What's your first name?" Steve, it's so good to meet you. Steve, would you mind? Could I just pray for that right now? We pray real briefly, no, n- not using any Christian words. Um, and then after we pray, we even take a step back to show with our body language that we're leaving. <laughs> and we say, before we go, would you mind if we came back another day, another time to share a story with you? And they say, most of them say, no, that'd be great. So you <clears throat> typically have you um, knocked on a door, 
so you know where you're going back to rather than just someone randomly on the street. That's right, yeah. So we go into the apartment complex or uh, neighborhood, um, knock on the door, introduce ourselves, go through that script that I just shared. And then at the end, when they say, yeah, come back, we say, when's the best time of the week to do that? Mm -hmm. And so they give us a time and then we just give them our names again. Again, my name's Garrett. This is Pete. It's an honor to meet you. And we leave. And we try to keep that first interaction real brief to show them that we're not Jehovah's Witness. We're not Mormons. We're simply trying to care for them. Um, and what we've noticed is, you know, the first season we did this, we were sharing the gospel on the doorstep. And what was happening was a lot of people were saying yes, but when we'd go back to follow up, we couldn't, they wouldn't answer the door. Uh, or anything like that. And so uh, an adjustment we made was saying, let's just care on the first one. And then when we go back, they open the door and they recognize us. And from there, they welcome us into their home. And then sitting in their living room, we share a true story from the word of God. And then on the back end, we share our story wrapped around the gospel. And uh, that's about a 20, 25 minute interaction. And what we noticed was as people came to Christ in their living rooms, in the places where they're most comfortable, it's most neutral for them, it's natural for them. When they come to Christ in their living rooms, uh, they're more likely to continue forward into discipleship. Um, it's a more authentic decision at that point. And so, and so that typically it's the second visit where, where you share a story and your story and then your story uh, wrapped in the gospel. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Second visit or even third sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but both times, every subsequent time we're telling them stories of hope. And on the back end of the story, we're just telling them our story, how we relate to the story. Okay. And once that happens, what, what comes next? Do you do discipleship in the home? That's correct. Yeah. What we've noticed is uh, it's vital that every believer is connected to a local body. And what we found is, uh, that some will uh, assimilate into the pre-existing church and others will start churches. And so what we say is, regardless of what they do, we have a strategy and we want every believer to be connected to an expression of the body so that all the expressions of the body are multiplying. And so with that in mind, we start in their home. And what we've noticed is over a 10 week period, we go through the seven commands of Christ. We, we look at Acts 2 together and we really let the Holy Spirit kind of work out in their hearts what church looks like. Okay. And so you've got seven areas. I was almost going to say you bite-sized pieces, but 200,000 is not a bite-sized piece. <laughs> but you, you each, you, you're raising up teams and, and leaders for each of those seven regions. And their goal is we're, we're just going to, to, to connect with as many people as we can, as many homes mm -hmm. and offer prayer and then follow up with that second visit and see whether they're ready to, to turn and believe then into discipleship. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. And um, one thing well, in there that yeah. we found really helpful is uh, in that 200,000, we've really broken that up into chunks and phases. Mm -hmm. So we just encourage the team that's owning that area to go in and we'll model this as well. Go in and prayer walk and just pay attention. What do you see? What do you hear from God? Are you getting any scriptures come to mind? What do you notice about life in the community? And just try to see what God sees. And then we'll, we'll do that with about three different communities. And then we'll debrief at the end and say, okay, where did you sense the most peace? Where should we start? And then we'll start there based on where the Holy Spirit led us. Okay, before you even talk to anyone. You're just going out and praying. Yeah, we just go pray and we ask God, do you have people of peace here? God, do you have four soul people here? And uh, we really want to lean on the Holy Spirit to guide us. Okay, give us another story. Um, I mean, we've heard Pete's story. Um, can you think of another story that comes to mind where you've seen that breakthrough in a community? Yeah, I can share a quick story. Okay, go ahead, Colin. Yeah, me and my wife, Lindsay, have, if you want to call it East Galilee, have just adopted that, and that's been our heart cry over this past year. And in the community, we just engage 
hundreds of people, but one that sticks out specifically now is just a couple named Memo and Casey, who we met very early on and who was already gathering youth in their uh, living rooms on Saturdays and Sundays. And uh, the difficulty they were running into is how to advance them forward and end up turning into almost like a, a daycare center for teenagers. And so Memo ended up scratching the whole concept and was frustrated. And through just us coming back over the next few months uh, and sharing with him more of a holistic process of how to get to church, it became, became clear to him what, what his role was in his community and in his connections. And what uh, Lindsay and I started to notice was uh, the vision was already in the community through Memo and the relationships were already there. And just empowering the insider has just been so vital and us spending all of our time with the memo and Casey's of the world. And so uh, through that memo, um, again, he scratched his youth coming in on Saturdays and Sundays, but has been going with us and we have been going with him to meet his relationships in the community and then meet new ones. And so through that over the past month and a half or so lately, there's been three or four um, of his connections as well as ours come to faith through memo and who have been baptized and who he's inviting in on the weekends to come and just do a start of a church in his home. And also Memo and Casey have been joining us on citywide trainings and they've really been uh, critical here lately of just what is our vision and goals for the East side specifically. And he's asking the question now, I need to do more, what do I do? And so um, as opposed to us engaging as many people as, as possible on the East side, We've just seen God has already implanted vision in people mm -hmm. and that his vision hasn't died. And we just have to find where God's vision is working. And that's been in people like Casey and Menno. So some of this is let, let, let's find somebody who's far from God. Um, and, and Pete, you're in that situation. And, and Colin, for you, it's, it's finding some, some believers that just need a bit of training and a bit of strategy and encouragement. They're both people of peace in the community. They're both ready for something more. Um, and I guess it's, it's also from what you're saying, it's not just what you can do or you and your wife can do as individual workers, but who can you train and mobilize? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Garrett, um, how is, how is that happening across the city then? We're getting an idea of what you you're doing locally what your ministry and the guys ministry look like in your patch mm -hmm. um how how is how is this happening across austin yep so um that that vision for galilee's we've we've met with the leaders that we've trained they're all going after that galilee vision and then up in the northwest part of the city there was a pastor who had already committed to doing this a while back and we we've Got, uh, we've been working together for a while and we just recently shared the Galilee idea with him and he said, we'll, we'll take, we'll take the Northwest. Um, and so it's happening in the Northwest and the North up, you know, in the suburbs, that area, um, all the way down to the urban center, down to the river. And then even South of the river in kind of the more hipster part of town, there's people going out, um, and caring for the community. And so what, what we've noticed is from whether you're talking about the suburbs or the urban poor, people want to be cared for and people are open to Jesus. And we're, we've noticed 60 to 80 percent of people, regardless of where they live, in, invite us back to share a story about Jesus. 60 to 80 percent of, of the people you pray for? Yeah. Wow. And typically of, of the people that you offer prayer to, what sort of percentage say, yeah? Good question. Um, I think that I'd say anywhere between any numbers. This might just give a good sense of one of the galleries because yeah. on the east side, uh, since February of this year is when we started engaging, and we've met roughly a thousand households. And out of that, 79% wanted us to come back and share a story after we offered prayer. And so that's about 800 homes that have wanted us to come and follow up. Wow. And that's basically been owned up to this point by a team of about 15 to 20 of us. 
So since February, we've tried to tackle as many of those follow-ups as possible. And we've got through about half of them and roughly 130 have come to faith through those follow-ups. Oh my. Um, that's a glimpse of what's happening in one area. And uh, we've seen consistently in each area, the Northwest, the North, Central, East, Southeast, and Southwest parts of the city. Time and time again, the lesson that we're learning personally is we have to repent and believe and die to ourselves and not let our experiences of failure uh, dictate what we believe of, is true about God. And, what, and that's just come through as we've looked at Jesus. He modeled for us what it looks like to live with full reliance on the Holy Spirit of God. That in Luke 3, he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came on him. And then everything he mentions from Luke 3 to Luke 8, it's all in reference to the Holy Spirit. And then in Luke 9, he, he empowers the 12 with the Holy Spirit. And in Luke 10, the same thing. And when you fast forward to Luke 24, there's two bombs that Jesus drops there that have just wrecked us in Austin. The one is the Great Commission. And it's the question of what did the disciples think to do when Jesus gave the Great Commission? Well, they thought to do exactly what Jesus had showed them to do. And then Jesus says, but wait in Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit comes. And it's as if Jesus bookmarks his whole ministry by saying, the next factor in the Great Commission is the Holy Spirit. It's not our methods. It's not our abilities. These aren't special people sitting here. We're just normal guys repenting and believing every day, laying down our life at the foot of the cross daily and saying, Holy Spirit, please show me where you're moving. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And it's, it's God's grace that is just advancing the kingdom and the leaders that are rising up. All, all, what we see our role as is teach people how to hear and obey the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's leadership development is get them addicted to the word of God and listening to God and obeying his commands. And when they do that, it's like a dog on a bone. You can't pull them off of the harvest. It's like, I, at this point, if I started telling Pete stuff that was heresy, he would hit me. <laughs> I think he would, yeah. <laughs> and the same with my team. Like, if, if, there, if I started going haywire, the team is so committed to Jesus and his kingdom and his glory and the Holy Spirit at work that uh, this is all of him. I'm just wanting to point that at him and say, those, those figures you hear across the city, He's doing it, and it's something that we just have to keep dying and, and keep repenting of uh, false beliefs about what Jesus is capable of.